Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan and I want to change how we perceive science fiction films. While some might just see the genre as entertainment, I see it as a collective group of thought exercises that is constantly guessing what our future will look like. And that's because most science fiction writers do base their lore somewhat on existing ideas and technologies. And in many cases, a lot of the technology that we use today was not conceptualized by engineers or inventors, but by artists. Now today, I want to look at five different things that we might think as science fiction that are actually science fact. Like him or not, Elon Musk is a thought leader and talented engineer. One of the things he likes saying a lot is that a lot of human beings are already cyborgs. Well, let's take a look at it. What is a cyborg? What is the definition? Well, according to dictionary.com, a cyborg is a person whose physiological functioning is aided by or dependent upon a mechanical or electronic device. That's a pretty broad definition if you really think about it. This means one does not need to be Anakin Skywalker or Robocop and have mechanical prosthetics all over their body to be a cyborg. Although to a certain extent, that already is actually a thing. Advanced prosthetics today have sensors attached to an individual's skin, which can sense electrical signals from our nervous system, which can then manipulate mechanical limbs. The next step would probably be to connect those sensors to our brainstem so we can have more accurate and quicker reaction times through these machines. Several defense companies are now working on a variety of different exoskeletons to increase the strength of the modern combat soldier, who oftentimes has to carry more than 50% of their own weight. Now, mechanical prosthetics and exoskeletons aren't something that the average person is going to use. For now, it's mainly limited to help people with certain disadvantages or injuries. But most of us do use a device that kind of makes us into a cyborg. As a matter of fact, you might be holding it right now. Yes, I'm talking about the smartphone. If you have internet service, which I'm guessing you do, you also have access to a huge depository of basically all the information available to humanity. We take this for granted, of course, because we're used to it. But back in the day, you had to go to a library, look at newspapers, magazines, there are these things called books and you had to search for them using a catalog system, which was a pain in the ass. And before there were libraries, you kind of just had to depend on other people's knowledge, which went wrong a lot of the times, which is why people thought the world was flat, and kind of still do. There are also tons of wearable devices now like Fitbits and Apple Watches. These devices can monitor your bio signals and connect you with other devices like Bluetooth headphones, for instance. There are also devices that you can put on your wrist that prevent nausea and prevent mosquitoes from biting you. And when I'm walking around in the city or sitting in the subway, I like to use Bluetooth headphones with noise cancellation features. This allows me to focus on other things. Maybe I want to read something. Also, when I'm riding a motorcycle, I have my helmet, which also has a comm system, which has voice activation, which allows me to manipulate my cell phone, which I use for GPS. And yeah, there's a lot of things going on here. Now in science fiction, the type of governments we see seem to be very different from the ones we have currently on Earth. Or do they? In a lot of dystopian sci-fi, you'll see totalitarian states or planet-wide governments control everything in their citizens' lives. But if you look at a country like China, they already are basically living in an Orwellian nightmare. At the end of last year, China had around 200 million surveillance cameras installed mostly in population centers. That's around one camera for every seven citizens. By next year, they want to increase that number to 400 million. They pair these surveillance cameras with state-of-the-art facial recognition and walking gait analysis. On top of that, the Chinese Communist Party wants to implement a social score for their entire population, which takes into account credit scores, criminal and employment history, and more importantly, your political loyalty to the party. Also, they'll be looking at other things things like behavior patterns, how much video games you like to play, and so on. Now, your score, if it's low enough, could actually limit your job opportunities, what kind of schools your children go to. It can also limit your ability to take public transportation or even planes. There's even talk about banning certain type of individuals with low enough scores from certain parts of the city. So yes, we're gonna have basically like a course on Underworld where the poor and the criminals are gonna be forced to live in. It's gonna be pretty bad. Some schools in China have started putting GPS trackers within their students' clothing, and some classes have even used facial recognition software to see if the students are paying attention. Now, this is obviously the extreme end of the spectrum. Or is it? I mean, the Chinese Communist Party is a totalitarian dictatorship, and it controls every aspect of life in China without opposition. Well, there is an opposition. They're just in jail, probably had their organs forcibly removed from their bodies, and they'll eventually get shot. So do make sure where your black market organs are coming from. Make sure it is on the level. 
But even here in the United States, our major cities are developing similar security infrastructures. Just look at the Jesse Smollett case. The Chicago Police Department was able to completely track his movement for most of the night using a network of CCTV to prove that he was completely full of it. In this case, the surveillance was definitely a good thing. The truth is privacy is dead, and I guess that bothers me a little more than, let's say, someone who's just been born 10 years ago where they've already grown up in this society where there is no privacy. But for me, it's going to be sad because when I'm old and gray, I'm going to be reminiscing about, you know, a period of time where I could be a private individual and, you know, people could rob liquor stores and get away with it. That's really depressing. I actually, armed robbery is on my bucket list, but I guess I'll never be stupid enough to attempt it now. But of course, it doesn't have to be that way. The opposite could happen. Recently, the lawmakers in Queens helped turn away Amazon from creating a new HQ in Long Island City. Now, I was talking to American Ben about this the other day, and I joked to him, not only is Long Island City turning away the future headquarters for Amazon, it's probably turning away the future capital of what will be the Amazon corporate state. Now, I say this because Amazon and companies like it are growing without restraint. While the Trumps of the world are pushing for protectionism in the face of rapid automation, the AOCs of the world are focusing on identity politics and class struggle. So all these politicians do understand that there are some very big problems in society right now, and a lot of that is driven by income inequality. The problem is both of these politicians, both of these sides, are attacking really the symptoms of the root cause, which of course is automation. Automation is no longer a thing that we have to worry about in the future, it's already here. PwC estimates that 38% of the current job market will disappear in the next 10 years due to automation. The McKinsey Global Institute did a study that states around 73 million American jobs will be lost by 2030. Let's do this one. And the most terrifying thing is that politicians on both sides of the divide are either ignoring this completely or not taking it seriously at all. Here's a quote from our current Secretary of Treasury, Steven Mnuchin. As it relates to artificial intelligence taking over American jobs, I think we're so far away from that, it's not even on my radar screen. It is terrifying that our Secretary of Treasury is either a complete moron and unaware of what's going on, or more likely, he's probably trying to protect us and prevent us from understanding just how much automation is going to affect our daily lives. Now, obviously, there's also a positive side to all of this. Goods will be cheaper and automation will increase our country's GDP significantly. Countries and industries that will be able to harness automation and its profits and work it into their business models are going to post record earnings. The problem is in the United States, our tax code is hilariously full of loopholes. And if you have a good enough accountant and enough money, you can basically avoid paying any tax. A company like Amazon continuously reinvests its revenues into exciting projects like their space program. While this does create jobs and stimulates the economy, it also allows Amazon to grow at a ridiculous speed. Amazon currently controls 50% of the e-commerce retail market. It's also making moves in several other industries, including healthcare, aerospace, food services, automated driving, cloud infrastructure, and software. The problem here is that government has always been terrible at keeping up with innovation, especially now as technology is moving more rapidly than ever. Amazon is obviously a monopoly, but the Federal Trade Commission simply is incapable of stopping it. As automation and space exploration continues to grow our economy and GDP, it's not going to be world governments collecting the benefits from these markets, but companies like Amazon. Now, there is an argument that because Amazon has all these resources at its grasp, that it'll be able to really rapidly change how the world works and fix problems that our government can't really solve. But for now, we can all remember that the local politicians in Long Island City have prevented New York City from becoming the future capital of the Amazon corporate state, or the United States of Amazon. We're actually Amazon Prime. So the true impact and destruction that AI will create will first be felt through massive unemployment and civil unrest that follows it. But what about killer robots? Isn't that the more traditional AI threat? Well, currently several nations right now are implementing AIs into different weapons platforms, weapons research, and also tactical research. AI and automation can also be a huge help when it comes to logistical and security concerns as well. The scary truth is automation and AI will be embraced by different military organizations around the world because of their need to compete with other nations. Autonomous weapon systems are eventually going to replace human warfighters in every way. Even now, most modern democracies with a free press cannot afford to get involved in a war like we were involved in in the early 2000s. This is why now we're seeing a huge growth in the use of private contractors in every part of the world. 
By using robots and mercenaries, you're alleviating a lot of the responsibility from these governing bodies. You're also not risking your citizens in combat. So there is a major upside to this. In the future, less humans will definitely die in combat. So the next thing we wanna talk about is a bit closer to home. Uh, recently, our other channel, Generation Tech, was contacted by a startup. Basically, they wanna use an AI program to uh, listen to my voice as I'm speaking, transcribe the entire script for a video, translate into Spanish, and then create an artificial Spanish version of me. One of the industries that will most likely disappear in the next few decades is call centers. Google is looking to replace all of its call centers with the duplex AI assistant, which will have a human-like voice. Amazon's Alexa is another contender in this market as well, which is predicted to be worth over $21 billion within three years from now, compared to the $6.8 billion industry it was in 2017. So automation is definitely here, and it's happening very, very quickly. And the problem is it's actually not creating real jobs. And the jobs that it is creating are usually uh, short-term jobs where humans are basically brought in to teach the AI to basically function better. These are jobs which will basically destroy themselves. As a matter of fact, you're probably unwittingly already helping an AI car learn how to recognize obstacles on the road. If you've ever participated in one of those proved you're not a robot captcha prompts, notice that all the pictures are always related to things you see when you drive. Well guys, I hope you let me know what you think about automation in the comments section down below. Also, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button if you haven't already. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. My name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.